Wake up with the news and information you can trust. Starting your day the right way with the Andy Griffin Show. This is News Radio 890, 92.5 KDXU. It's Monday, 908 on KDXU. I'm Andy Griffin. Thank you for tuning in on this beautiful Monday morning. Yes, it can be beautiful and Monday, despite what Karen Carpenter says. Jason, are you old enough to be a Karen Carpenter uh, liker and all? Or Jason Chaffetz, by the way, with I, me. I, yeah, I still remember my parents listening to her all the time. Yes. <laughs> Rainy days and Mondays always get me down, she used to say. But, man, it's beautiful out there this morning. And, uh I don't think there's any reason to be down at, at all. I, I don't know. The, Utah in the fall is the best. I just love football's back. Yeah. The the leaves start changing soon. It's awesome. And by the way, Jason, former BYU kicker, Coos got her done this weekend over Wyoming. Ten in a row now against the Pokes. That's got a – that feels pretty good, huh? Yeah, anytime you can beat Wyoming, it's a good day. Uh, Lavelle <laughs> Edwards, I think, had that famous quote that he never – they always remind him of is yeah I'd much rather lose and live in Utah than win and be, be, be in Laramie. I think it was something like that. It was pretty uh, funny. Yeah, I'm sure there are a few Wyomingites around listening right now, and I apologize to them. But our apologies to them. But you know what? He's he's right. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Anyway, Jason, thanks for coming on today. The news, the news this morning, of course, was uh, another um, perhaps assassination attempt on the president. This time, no shots were fired at the president, but uh, because the Secret Service was, was able to root the guy out on a golf course before he got to the president. But uh, President Trump is blaming the rhetoric of uh, Kamala Harris and Joe Biden for the reason for what's happening. What do you think? Well, when you call the president an existential threat to democracy and you mm. refer to him as Hitler and that sort of thing, you know, people that are lacking some mental stability, I mean, it has an effect. And, um, you know, the the left tries to claim all the time that it's the radical right that's, that's having all these, uh, using all this inflammatory language. And clearly there are probably some examples, but they are just notorious on the left for the vehemence the, 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 in dividing this country and telling us that, the, you know, that, uh, the, you know, the deplorables out there and all yeah. of these bad people that are, that want to ruin our country. And I just, I just think it goes too far. But anyway, I look, there's some heroic efforts by the secret service that, you know, smothered the president again, a secret service agent who suddenly sees a gun, takes that weapon out and starts firing that that's that's hard to do you gotta make some split second decisions on, regarding life or death but i gotta tell you it still bothers me i'm still fired up about the idea about how poor the secret service operated as a whole mm -hmm. as a as a group protecting the president of the united states the leading candidate for president of the united states at this point we got to do better they, we got lucky yet again do, let's break that down a little bit. Does he need uh, now? He doesn't have what you would call a full presidential detail guarding him. But uh, d does he need more sec Secret Service? Does he need better Secret Service? Is it a DEI thing? What, what is it, Jason? Do you think? Well, remember, uh, nine ten years ago, I had done a two and a half year investigation into the Secret Service, looked at more than one hundred and fifty security incidents, and I got to tell you, uh, there are five key things. Um, one is the problems of the Secret Service. Uh, recruitment is a big issue. Workload is an issue. Training, communications, and technology. And when they go back and look at Butler, they're going to find that the communication technology piece of this was abysmal. They never fixed and cleaned that up. Workload is just unbelievable. And, um, you know, and they, there are more than a thousand there are more than a thousand agents shy of where they're supposed to be. And so when you wow. have that combination and look, the budget has been plussed up for the secret service by more than a billion dollars a year. So they don't have any excuses um, in terms of funding from Congress. I do believe that Donald Trump, JD Vance, Tim Waltz, Kamala Harris, and Joe Biden should have the full array of, of protection. Those five people at this point have got to have the full presidential level type of security presence. Um, 
you know, the two vice presidential candidates, you can make an argument a little bit less, but we're in a hot contested race. And, um, and we've had two incidents in the last 60 days. Yeah. Is, is, uh, is that a reflection of society right now? Or is it a reflection of the, um, the rhetoric, the, the, the language that the candidates are using? What, what do you think is the biggest root problem for the violence uh, that we're seeing? And will it continue? Look, I think the I think the violence and the the mental instability is probably much higher than it used to be. Mm -hmm. But I do think I do think that there and there are some deep societal problems. Um, I think exacerbated in part by social media. Um, but the Secret Service has to act as if there's a, always an ongoing threat. We know the Iranians in particular. Um, want to take down these, uh, the former presidents. There are some other people on their list. Um, they, they definitely are going after Donald Trump. We have, you know, Kamala Harris and, and, uh, Joe Biden have let hundreds, hundreds of known terrorists come into our country. Yeah. Um, and, and so you just never know when they're going to pop up. What if there were three or four shooters? that were actually well-coordinated and well-positioned. What, what would the Secret Service have done then? One of the things that bothers me most about this incident, by the way, Andy, it's just this whole idea that once the Secret Service fired, a guy jumps out of the bushes, goes and gets in his car, and there's just a citizen who says, wow, person getting out of, his, out of the bushes and into the car, I'll take a picture of that. That's wow. the only way, evidently, at least with the limited information we have right now, maybe that changes, but the limited information we have right now, that's how they found this guy? Is a citizen took a picture? You tell me you can't put a sheriff deputy or a uniformed Secret Service agent outside that perimeter line? I mean, the president is going to walk really close to that fence line. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's actually, I would say, uh, beyond, uh, besides unbelievable, unconscionable, right? I mean, come on, we're... We're talking about former President Donald Trump. We're talking about a guy who was nearly killed. I mean, fractions, inches away from not being here anymore on this planet. Well, and that that's his home course. I, I mean, how many hundreds of times has he probably played on that course? You, ha you haven't figured out how to secure it yet? Yeah. We got lucky in that, fortunately, had a, a really good agent who spotted, you know, a gun poking out. But think about the greenery. How easily that he could have not seen that. Where's yeah. the canine team? I, I mean, I've been around the president. I've actually golfed with President Trump. Um, you know, but when he was president, there were canine teams out there. How come there were there canine teams? Where were they deployed? A canine running up and down, one to hole ahead of the president. They're going to sniff out anybody in the bushes in a heartbeat. You know how easy it is for a dog to find a person in the bushes? Yeah. I mean, they would have alerted on that so quickly. By the way, uh, for those just tuning in, President, there, there was a man. Uh, it was on President Trump's Royal Golf Course. Uh, I don't know, Royal Trump Golf, whatever it is, uh, the name of the course. But uh, a man was hiding in the bushes with a scoped rifle about 500 yards from where the president was. And fortunately, was spotted by a Secret Service agent. A little gunfight ensued, but the man was able to get away unharmed. Fortunately, as Jason pointed out, a citizen, someone uh, outside the golf course, took a picture of the man getting in his car and that's pretty much how they found the guy. He surrendered as soon as he was pulled over. But the whole thing is certainly troubling, especially considering it was, uh, like you said, less than 60 days ago, uh, a guy got on a roof, unquestioned, got on a roof and took a shot and missed, actually hit the president, killed someone else and missed, uh, missed uh, killing the former president by an inch or, or two. It's, it's all very yeah. troubling, Jason. Yeah, look, uh, we we got to do better than this. I, this is on Alejandro Mayorkas, the Secretary of Homeland Security. They have the resources. We issued a report nine, ten years ago about all the problems and challenges they needed to to, to take care of. They didn't do that. Um, and I don't know how Secretary Mayorkas can look anybody in the eye and say, "Yeah, I'm doing a good job." He he should be. He really should be dismissed at this point. Should the candidates kind of maybe follow this up with? Maybe making statements that aren't quite so uh, inflammatory. Uh, look, at this point, uh, I think what so much has been said, there is a deeper-seated um, animosity and division in this country than any 
inflammatory sentence or two. I do think that um, you can you can pull out different. Look, you got people with mental instability, and in this particular case, it does appear it's just an appearance. It's an allegation that this person was really um, pro Kamala Harris, anti Donald Trump. That's why he's trying to kill him. He was very pro Ukraine, which is your right to be pro Ukraine. But you know, he he took actions that were beyond reason, and he you know he set up a GoPro to video it all. I yeah. mean, this is a person who's really off his off his rocker allegedly. Yeah, it's uh, definitely uh, scary. Not not some. You know, it's funny in in radio, and you're on you know radio and television. Jason, and they always say, don't say too much personal about your own life. Don't, you know, you don't want to give out your phone number. You don't want to say where you live because there are, well, for lack of a better word, crazies out there. And uh, it's something, I've been in radio, Jason, for over 30 years, and I've never felt like that was a big deal to me. Even even hosting this more political bent of a show I'm hosting now, I just never felt it was a big deal. But maybe I need to rethink my position. I don't know. Well, you know, the higher profile, you can imagine it, President, how the, the influx. I can tell you, I, you know, when I was in Congress and as chairman of the Oversight Committee, I had death threats on a regular basis. And which ones do you take serious and which one do you not? And, you know, there was a guy in Florida, for instance, that was uh, not only charged but convicted of, of death threats against me. And uh, it went and served time in jail. Wow. And and those people are out there. I know the FBI had to visit some people, uh, one in uh, Arizona, another one in Washington State, and we've had incidents here in Utah. You know, unfortunately, if I'm in a high-profile event, I have off-duty police officers that I pay, um, but I pay them to help secure me. You don't see them, but they're there in case something goes, you know, somebody decides to get a little... Um, aggressive or do something stupid, and it's a it's a real expense, and you know it's part of the territory of being on TV and being in Congress, and I it's it shouldn't be that way, but yeah. it is, and I I know that and do that with my eyes wide open, but I have to pay pay these people, and and fortunately a lot of them would do it for free, but I I can't take them away from their families for hours on end without paying them. That's just not fair. Yeah. I uh, actually someone commented to me this morning. Well, Trump's a billionaire. Why doesn't he pay for his own security? Why doesn't he have more people on his payroll that are helping protect him? Yeah, you know, there's some people saying, "Hey, do you go out and hire some some really high quality uh, people?" I look. This is a the Secret Service mission is not just to protect the protectees; they're protecting the United States of America. Yeah. You do not want any one of the protectees, and there's a list of them. It's shorter than most people think it is. Um, if something were to happen to one of those people, that the country is in peril, and that includes their family members, which would put a candidate or an office holder in a compromised position. Um, it, it's just, it's really, uh, it, it's something that the government has access to intelligence and uh, other uh, things that they can tap into that is highly classified. And I just don't think you can you can um, dole that out to some private entity. Okay, good point, good point. Uh, I have not, <clears throat> excuse me, talked to you since the debate. Uh, you, depending on who you ask, you know, it, it's like one of those split decision boxing matches. Depending on who you ask, they'll say, well, we won. Well, no, we won. What was your gut reaction when that thing finished up? Um, I thought Kamala Harris was more poised than a lot of people, including myself, uh, thought she would be. But I don't think that she achieved her goal, which was to, you know, tie Donald Trump up in in knots and make him, you know, come out with some ad that she could just ride to the finish line. I don't think she I don't think she accomplished that. Um, it, she tried. Donald Trump. <laughs> she, she tried. And look, come look. Donald Trump answered every question and more. I mean, he, he, he did kind of take the bait at the end of the questions when she would throw something that has nothing to do with the question off, and then he would answer it, you know. But that's the kind of person he is. 
I think Kamala Harris really negated any gain that she might have had when she did her very first one-on-one interview. First one. Yeah. Uh, with that, that uh, if you haven't seen it, watch it start to finish, 10 minutes or so, of the interview that she did um, in, in Philadelphia. I think it was Channel 6 in Philadelphia. I haven't watched that. Oh, only, only sound bites, as I've heard. It's embarrassing. It is absolutely. How would you fix the economy? What's the first thing you would do, you know? Well, I grew up in a middle-class family. Like, it has nothing to do with <laughs> the issues of the day. And yeah. I think she looked like the, you know, the fake candidate that she is, the poll-driven person who really doesn't understand policy, which is kind of important for being president. Yeah. Uh, someone asked Bernie Sanders uh, what he thought of Kamala changing her, uh, yeah. I don't know, opinions on all these different, all these different uh, important issues. And he said, oh, she's still the same Kamala. She's just changing her public opinion so that she can win votes. I mean, that was essentially what he said. I'm, I'm summarizing, but that's basically what he said. What do you think of that? Oh, I think that's the truth. I think she, he called it pragmatic, but essentially what he was saying is, well, yeah, she's just saying whatever she needs to say in order to win the election. Mm-hmm. And I think that's exactly right. I think the most powerful tool that Republicans and Donald Trump has is just play the video on the big issues of the day, whether it be the border wall or, uh, you know, safety and security, getting rid of ice. She wants to get rid of plastic straws. She, you know, anything, any inflation issues. She has promised us she's going to raise taxes. Then she goes out and says, well, I want to lower taxes. If you get rid of the Trump tax cut, that's raising taxes. She wants to increase the the rate of taxes on capital gains. She wants to tax unrealized capital gains. Yeah. She wants to increase the corporate income tax. All of that is going to make life more expensive and government bigger. Why? That's not what this country needs. Early on in Joe Biden's presidency, he appointed his vice president, Kamala Harris, as the uh, being in charge of the border, the southern border of the United States with Mexico. Uh, it didn't work out so well for the United States, it doesn't seem, because basically illegal immigrants were pouring across the border at an unprecedented rate. Kamala says she's done a good job and that it's actually the Republicans' fault that more more things haven't been done. And I, I, her, her, her followers believe her. They, they're buying into that. Jason, what, what do we do? Yeah, they try to point to this bill that failed in the Senate. It failed. Yeah. yeah. And and so don't blame it. And remember, how convenient. I wish the president would bring this up. But the Democrats, they had the majority in the House, the Senate, and the White House the first two years of their administration. So if they wanted to pass it, they could have introduced it and actually passed it. But they didn't. And the reason they did it is they knew that this issue was there. Look. They're open borders. They believe in open borders. They don't believe there should be limits. And why should we accept a bill? Let's let's buy into their premise where 2,500 people a day can come into this country illegally. And then what? They're going to ring a bell and say, oh, no more. We're at our limit today. That number should be zero. Yeah. Come in through the front door legally and lawfully. We have a higher moral obligation for those people than we do to let people in here illegally. And I don't buy this comprehensive immigration reform. That's that code word, you know, amnesty. That's not what we should be doing in this country. And now we got 10 to 20 million people here illegally. And you have everybody in at the state level and at the federal level saying, oh, we got a housing shortage. Well, why do you think you have a housing shortage? Because you got 10 or 20 million people here need a place to live. Yeah. So the cost of rent and everything else is going to go way up. It's just supply and demand. It's basic economics. Uh, neither one of us is Catholic, but the Pope well, went on record yesterday, I think maybe Saturday, uh, of saying uh, American Catholics need to vote for the lesser of two evils. He mentioned Kamala Harris approving abortion was evil, and then he mentioned that it's a sin that uh, Donald Trump would want to deport illegal immigrants. And uh, he said, you need to pick which is the lesser of two evils. And then he said, I don't know which one it is. Uh, there's a, there are millions of Catholic Americans who are hoping the Pope would tell them who to vote for. And now he's calling them both evil. What do you think? I, 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 I tend to like this Pope, I, but I, I don't know that I, just, I totally agree with that sentiment. But to try to equate uh, deportation for somebody who's here illegally with abortion, 
Yeah. Um, I, 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 you terminate a, a life in its ninth month, like the Democrats, some of the Democrats, Kamala Harris want to do. There's no equivalency, I, I think. That, that is just my take. But again, I, I have great respect for the Pope and, and, um, I like his style. He, 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 he He's always out there, and I, 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 I listen to what he says. Yeah. And, uh, an, an interesting guy. I think a, a little bit progressive, maybe more progressive than Catholics would like in some instances. Yeah. And uh, But, uh, yeah, an interesting guy. And certainly, you know, religion, we don't want to get too much into that, and that's a personal choice. But um, sure. I just thought it was interesting that he said the lesser of two evils, but he didn't know which one that was. That was surprising to me. So. Yeah, you know, you got, I think they're also trying to be careful and meddling in a, you know, in an election outside of their, you know, where they live, and you know, but you know, this is everybody gets to make these decisions for themselves, and the beauty of the system. I just hope everybody gets registered and ends up voting. That's always yeah. it's amazing how many people won't vote. Get out and vote, Jason. I know you got to go in a minute. I wanted to ask you, uh, how can we? We want to hear. We want to see you on TV. How can we find Jason Chaffetz on Fox in the next few days? Um, I think I'm going to be on Fox Business on the Big Money Show at about 11:40 a.m. Mountain Time, and then I think I'm going to be on. And I always say think because they have a, they change the schedule back and forth, but somewhere between one and two p.m. I should be on Fox with uh, Martha McCallum. But with all the breaking news, that could change in a heartbeat. But at least I'm scheduled to do that at least for today. For today, and then what about tomorrow? Oh. That's way in the future. Are you kidding me? It's television. I can't predict that. I, okay. I didn't think I was going to be on yesterday, and I was on twice. So I, uh, I just never know. Never awesome. Know. He's Jason Chaffetz, former BYU football player and Fox superstar. Jason, thank you for spending a few minutes with us today. Always enjoy it. Always enjoy it. Thanks for having me in. All right. Talk to you later. KDXU News Time is 930. We're going to take a weather break when we come back. We're going to talk a little bit about cell phones. There was an interesting question posed online yesterday. And I thought we might spend a few minutes. We'll even get Stockton's take on this one coming up. Uh, it's about cell phone use and, well, privacy issues and marriage. And, well, we'll get into that when we come back. Wake up with the news and information you can trust. This is the Andy Griffin Show on News Radio 890, 92.5 KDXU, Southern Utah's News Talk Leader. Welcome back. I'm Andy. Stockton's over there, too. You with us, Stockton? Yes, I am. All right. Good to hear your voice, my friend. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for being here. Uh, thanks to Jason Chaffetz also for spending a little while with us giving, getting his take. Now, Jason did uh, kind of an expose study on the Secret Service a few years ago. I think it was three years ago. And uh, so really, anybody, uh, talking to the breaking news this morning about another perhaps attempt on uh, President Trump's life. And he says the Secret Service has plenty of money. They have what they need to do the job. They're just not doing it. So... An interesting, interesting take this morning. Uh, we're going to change uh, topics just a little bit. And, uh, and one of the reasons I got Stockton on here, I want to get his uh, take on this. All right. So there's a website out there, and I can't say what website it is. Uh, it's a, actually a Facebook page, rather. Uh, but and, and I can't use any names on this because I don't have permission. But I'm going to use what they say and uh, get your thoughts on this. Uh, all right. So here's the post. Posting anonymously because there are a lot of people in this group who know me. This is a controversial topic here. Should spouses be able to have access to the their their spouse's phone? For example, my husband has full access to my phone, knows the password, and can get at it anytime he wants. It's not that way for me. He refuses to keep uh, the same password and won't give it to me when he does change it. I get told no if I ask to use his phone. I have literally no access to his phone. What are your thoughts? I'm not sure how I should feel about this. If I bring up the topic, he gets upset and comes up with some excuse as to why I can't. Let's have legit talk about this. How do I go about uh, go about it without causing a fight? Now, my gut feeling, first of all, I'll give my gut feeling, then we'll get Stockton's. My gut feeling is that dude's hiding something. 
there's, <laughs> there's something on that phone he doesn't want his wife to see, whether it's, you know, chats with a different girl, whether it's porn, whatever it is, there's stuff on there that he is hiding. That's my gut feeling. Uh, my wife actually asked me this morning when she read this uh, this post, she said, do you do you feel spouses should have access to each other's phones? I said, absolutely. I have nothing to hide. If you have nothing to hide, we should be able to get it on each other's phones at all times. And in fact, her phone and my phone have the exact same password so that either mm. one of us can look at each other's phone at any time we want, we would like. Now, and, and we can start getting into the whole trust thing and all that stuff. And I do trust my wife and I think I'm pretty sure she trusts me. But, you know, bottom line is if you trust someone, you know, prove it give full access to your world. Stockton, do you have any uh, different feeling about that or how do you feel? I think it differs on the relationship um, because uh, in the case of the anonymous post you just mentioned, Mm -hmm. uh, obviously there is something weird going on there. And I would say that's the one thing that I think is not okay. You can't be like, this person has access to my phone, but he won't give me access to his phone. It needs to be both ways. You need to either allow access to both their phones or... Just don't allow access to either of your phones in general if you feel that way. Because I have, um, I have uh, friends who are married and they don't let each other look at each other's phone. Hmm. They will because they're just like, no, I'm just going to trust you about that. So they argue that the trust is knowing that they won't do anything dumb, rather than checking on making sure they're not doing anything dumb. It's kind of a it's it's it's. A, like I said, it just really depends on the relationship and who's actually, you know, leading the ship there. <laughs> Let me read a couple of the comments. Uh, this is interesting right here. He said, it was never an issue for me until I had something to hide. Yeah. I'm not perfect. And at one point I was up to no good. And that's when I put a passcode on my phone. And by the way, this is pretty, pretty frank confession by this person. Uh, and it's a female. She said, uh, I put a passcode on my phone when I never had one before or had an issue sharing my phone even for a quick minute. The topic of whether it should be quote unquote allowed or not is a, is controversial and a bit subjective. There should be a conversation of boundaries right at the start of a relationship right. and a refresher doesn't hurt. Now, in my personal experience of only 30 years on this planet, but still relevant, it's 2024. Never go through a man's smartphone unless... You're 100% ready to leave. Hmm. That's an interesting take because if he's hiding something and you find out what it is, uh, I, I, do you want to know? Yeah, exactly. Do you want the relationship to end? Are you ready to... Do you have a, enough faith in your relationship that you yeah. can get through that? Are you ready yeah. to walk away? Oh, man. Do you want to take the red pill or the blue pill? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I, there was an interesting story. This is about trust, too. I, I heard a story yesterday. A guy was was first married, and uh, they went on a kayaking trip, and he's kayaking down. I, I don't even know what river it was, but he said at, at one point his newly his new bride was a, way up ahead. He said about a half a mile ahead, and she was kayaking right next to and having this uh, what looked like a very uh, intense conversation with the guide, the river guide. And he being a half a mile back, he said, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I was a little, I was a little, I guess, jealous is the word. I, she's having a talk with this guy we're newly with. Why is it she, you know, kayaking next to me, having this conversation with me? And uh, he says, and then a few years later, uh, about three years later, he says, I grew up a lot. He says, because three years later, my wife wanted to go play tennis with some guys. She's a tennis player. I'm not. He said, so... I let her go play tennis with the guys. He said, I actually went and, you know, from afar and watched him play and have fun. And he said, he said, I grew up a lot because it was okay with me if she was hanging out with a bunch of guys playing tennis. Whereas three years earlier, it wasn't okay where she was hanging out with that guide when she could have been hanging out with me. And so my wife and I, as usual, had a conversation after we'd heard the story. And I said, I don't, I actually am the opposite of that guy. I don't think I would have been too jealous if we were on the river and my wife was talking to the guide one-on-one, I think I would have been more jealous if my wife had gone off, you know, to, he actually went to Cedar, she went to Cedar City to play uh, with these guys. If she'd have gone and played tennis with a bunch of dudes without me being invited. I don't know. What do you think? 
Uh, I don't think I'm experienced enough to have that. <laughs> I will. I will say this. Um, my. I. Uh, for those who don't know, I am divorced. Um, but uh, I wasn't married that long. I was married a mo- a year and three months, and uh, one of the biggest problems in my marriage was essentially being the need of being attached to the hip at all times. Um, and, uh, so I know for a fact that if my spouse at the time heard that I was even working with a woman at work, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like just in a professional manner, she would get absolutely fussy in every single sense. The word she would interrogate me. She would do all that. And that's, that's a little much. Yeah. It's a little much. It's a little much. By the same token, uh, my wife has worked for uh, Washington City for twenty, well, almost thirty years. Right. Uh, at, at one point, one of the city managers had a um, kind of I don't know if it's a tradition or he had this deal that he wanted to go out to lunch one on one with every single one of his employees, and at, at, it got to the point where he was going. It was my wife's turn. He was going to go to lunch, just him and her alone, to lunch. And I was like, "He's a dude. She's a woman. They're about the same age." I, I don't. I don't feel super comfortable yeah. with her going out to lunch with her boss that's, alone. That's very understandable. Now, I, I don't think I was being unreasonable or, or you know, green-eyed monster jealousy or anything like that. I just thought that's a little bit improper. Well, and you, of course you would feel uncomfortable about that. Yeah. How yeah. did she feel about that? Well, she didn't go. She's she didn't like, go. She's oh. like, uh, how about... And she actually got a couple of other... She's like, why don't you do all of our lunches combined? And there was, she got two other women in the office to go, and they went. Four people went to lunch together, and I was fine with that. That was cool. And would you be more? Would you have been more fine with it if it was just like a simple one-on-one meeting? Well, I mean, they have those exactly. Yeah. So it's just yeah, a normal thing. Yeah. So if they didn't make, he didn't make it into like a grand occasion, like one-on-one lunch alone with the boss. Yeah, like, let's you, go to Cliffside, just you and I. Yeah. And oh, yeah. well, yeah. Okay, that's that's yeah. <laughs> So if, so let me get this straight. If it was Applebee's, you would have been like, no, no, <laughs> he's got no game. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't know about it. Maybe McDonald's. You know, <laughs> but, um, all right, a couple of other comments from that. Remember, the question was, my husband won't give me access to his phone. Right. He keeps changing the password. Oh, how should I feel about this? Well, and also, he has access to her and phone. And he has access to her phone. Here's a couple more comments. Honestly, my husband and I have full access to each other's phones. In my opinion, if he gets upset when you ask, he is hiding something. I just got a text from someone that said, that guy is hiding something or has control issues. Right. Uh, here's another one. My partner and I have full access to each other's uh, logins and passwords. It's not even about trust, but we share a lot of <clears throat> a lot of accounts, too. So it's actually useful. It is... Uh, it, Let's see. It is way weird that he changes his passwords if he has nothing to hide. Yeah. Why waste energy changing the passwords so often? Uh, that that commenter brought up a good point. You know, when my mom passed away, she was. We were lucky. She went. She had a little <clears throat> little notebook that had all the passwords of all the accounts and everything. And so when she passed away. We actually had it like a guidebook to help, you know, bank accounts and credit card, everything. And and that was nice to have. But, you know, if you can't get access to your spouse's uh, phone and they pass away, I know this is kind of a side issue. But still, that you may not have access to a whole bunch of stuff that you need access to. So, very interesting. Uh, I, again, I'll stand by what I said right off the, right off the get-go, though. That guy's hiding something. If he keeps changing his passwords and he won't let his wife look at his phone, there's something on there he doesn't want her to see. That's how I feel. I agree. So, all right. Well, that, again, another commercial break. And we come back. I, boy, I saw a, a fantastic story online today uh, about, it's on Deseret.com. It's about how, we're staying on the cell phone topic, about how, uh, this girl's cell phone has stolen away the joy from her life. Uh, it, it's a great read. Trust me on this. I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs from it, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about when we come back. All the latest news, weather, traffic, and sports, just like you like them. You're waking up with The Andy Griffin Show on News Radio 890, 92.5 KDXU, Southern Utah's News Talk Leader. 
All right, welcome back. About done at 9.50. If you want to come and give me a text at 467-5842. That's 435 area code 467-5842. Uh, you yeah, just to kind of put a bow on the whole, uh, is he hiding something on the cell phone privacy? So the, the, the story is this. A woman posted up anonymously and said, my husband has full access to my cell phone and iPad, but he will not give me any access. He keeps changing the password to his phone. Should I be worried? Is he hiding something? One last comment. This was a good one. It says, if you're feeling like you need to look at his phone, your gut feeling is telling you something. My husband and I do not look at each other's phones. We don't know each other's passwords. We don't track each other's locations. I can tell by his actions and how he treats me that we are good. I have never felt the need to look at his phone. He hasn't ever asked me to use mine either. That's kind of what you were saying, Stockton, is is that, you know, if you if you don't feel the need, then don't worry about it, right? Exactly. It was just kind of like a putting, well, I mean, it's, you, you put faith in your spouse and you don't need physical proof to show that your faith is true what do you think about the idea someone else commented about well make sure you ask permission or you at least tell them you want to look at their phone uh if you look at it while secretly that actually is a betrayal of trust so about that? actually 100 percent, yeah i think that is kind of a betrayal of trust because if you're like i mean if if my spouse asked me like can i look at your phone i'd be like sure no problem yeah but if they're like intentionally like behind my back you leave the room and they grab, the, room phone and they grab and, yeah. the phone and they're doing that then i would be a little because then that that implies mistrust mm. you know yeah. what i mean i agree and so that's yeah I, I i i feel the same all right here's a text from a listener i was married to my husband for about 15 years at the time when i found out he was into porn probably all those years he lied to all the bishops and stake presidents being temple worthy all those years the truth finally came out we divorced after 17 years i was very naive and he knew it yeah sad sad i i believe and and i've told this to my wife and i and first of all i will say this i told my wife we should never ever have secrets from one another I feel like I, I'm an open book. Anything she wants to know, I will tell her. Anything I want to know, she will tell me. But I think there are a few, a few exceptions that she has made over the years. Every once in a while, she won't tell me something that she thinks might be harmful to me. Okay. So, you know, I, I, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know what those are exactly. But every once in a while, she'll be like, I could tell you, but you wouldn't like it. So I'm so, not going to tell It's you. so funny because I've heard that comment, mm -hmm. but not from like a significant other. I've heard that from one of our bosses. Really? Yes. Uh, this this isn't like a secret or anything like that. Uh, so we actually have a feedback page on our website. Uh -huh. um, and uh, sometimes uh, there's a listener who's not very happy. Um, <laughs> and who knew? Um, what are the odds? And uh, sometimes they don't like the way I report on things, and they'll hmm. give me a very uh, bad. I'll review. just say worded hmm. email, uh, hmm. and so uh, my bosses will actually keep that hidden from me because they know if if I see it, then I'm going to get all self conscious, and I'm not going to do my job right. <laughs> um, because my job as a journalist is to be as neutral as possible, and I I shouldn't be swayed one way or another by you know comments. So well, you know this having been in theater because uh, uh, it's a lot like being in journalism. Is uh, one of my friends told me this way early on in my in my, in my uh, career. He said, "Never believe them when they tell you how good they are." Or, or how bad you are. I, I never, yeah. I never, ever, ever comment on my acting ability. Yeah. Ever. No. I, I never do. I, I let the director do that for me. <laughs> I let the director do that for me and, and I decide. And they'll tell you, yeah, they'll, they'll be honest. Yeah, and director. here's the thing. I don't listen to the audience members when they talk about, like, how good I am or how yeah. bad I am. What about it, reviews? Reviews? Uh, uh, written I, reviews. I fortunately haven't been in that kind of situation oh, really? yet. Well, because uh, with community theater... It's one thing to insult an actor or criticize an actor. A pro. Like a pro, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's another thing to criticize a, an, a person who has gone out of their way to essentially have a second life as a community, the, community theater actor. Go out there. He's a dentist by day and he goes out there and then you know, becomes I, uh, Jean Valjean at night. I, I actually have a, 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 a little story about that. Way years ago, so, so between my sophomore and junior year at college, uh, I, I did an internship at a community newspaper in a small Idaho town. 
uh, while I was interning, like two weeks into my internship, the editor got sepsis and died in the hospital. Oh, wow. And now this is a small town newspaper. It was a small show, small crew. Basically, they said, hey, the newspaper is yours the rest of the summer. Whoa. I was like, ah, uh, you know that I'm like 21 years, 22 years old and a sophomore in college and have no idea what I'm doing, right? And they're like, it doesn't matter. You just, just put the newspaper out every week. It'll be fine. Just put the newspaper <laughs> out. Just so, put the newspaper out every week. So this town, the community theater in this town was putting on a play. It was Pippin, actually. Okay. I remember the play. And uh, me being kind of stupid and young, I don't know if stupid is the right word, but insensitive and young. Oh, did you uh, give them wrote, a scathing review? Instead of writing a, a there's, there's a review and then there's a, uh, there's another word. Anyway, uh, 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 I decided, no, there's a critique and a review. I decided to write a critique instead of a review oh. on the community theater. And uh, what I wrote was mostly nice, but there were a few things that I wrote that were not that nice Yeah, about actors and what they did and how they acted and stuff. And so I actually got called into the the owner's office on the, the day after the paper came out. And he said, what were you thinking? And I'm like, well, I just did what I've read in other big newspapers. I wrote a critique. And he's like... This is a weekly community paper in a small Idaho town. You don't write a critique. Yeah. You write a review. Yeah. I learned the hard way. And I feel bad. Well, Honestly, to this day, I still feel bad about some of the things I wrote about those people that were, like you said, they were they were working for free and putting in all this time. And, you know, I don't know. I, I, was, I was insensitive. Uh, I would say the same <laughs> thing because uh, with my critique, I actually do uh, reviews every now and again. Uh, on the website and uh, yeah it's just you need to find the good and then here's the thing if you're if you if you if you know how to do it you can slide a little bit of the criticism in there yeah. uh, just from subtext but yeah if you're 22 and insensitive like I was probably not so much all right uh, real quick I promise this we only have two minutes so I'm gonna uh, mention this a couple times so this late this girl by the name of Grace Waite wrote this wrote wrote this uh, editorial for uh, Deseret News and I highly recommend you go read it because it is very well written. I'm very impressed with this young lady. Uh the, the it says opinion seeing smartphone addiction for what it is. Uh she talks about how one summer it was the summer before her senior year in high school. She was starting to experience kind of depression and, and and not she couldn't put a finger on why all the things that she used to love like hanging out with friends, playing her sports, uh doing the things that she liked we're not no longer giving her joy, and she couldn't figure out why. I'm going to read you two paragraphs real quick. It wasn't until a family camping trip that I discovered the real culprit, something small and virtually unstoppable, a subtle killer. The enemy of the happiness that I had been looking for was in my back pocket. My family returned home on a night that my friends and I had planned a party. We had a dress code, special decorations, and games. I, it was sure to be an excellent time. I arrived home a few hours before the party, feeling tired. I went to my bedroom in the basement and decided I needed to relax a little before going to the party. So after almost four days of no, no phone, I connected to the Wi-Fi, typed in my passcode, and began to scroll. I clicked into every app on my phone, catching up on the feed that I had missed, aimlessly meandering through endless content the algorithms put in front of me. I was numb, unaware, and unfeeling. Slowly, the time ticked away until it was far past the time I needed to leave for the party. Deciding that it was too late, I turned back to my screen. But then came a moment that forever changed the way I viewed tech, both technology and myself. Suddenly, I was seeing myself as if from an outside perspective. I found myself staring down at me as I hunched over the screen in my hand. My family was upstairs and my friends were off having fun together. What on earth was I doing? My stomach was twisting. I clicked into et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, it goes on. It's a great read, and it's a really good editorial on what we are doing when we crawl inside that cell phone. We're robbing ourselves, folks. We're robbing ourselves of joy. I'll talk to you tomorrow.